Good morning. This is Chewing the Grizzle with Al Black and Tim Conroy. It's a poetry chat, and our guest today is the poet Ed Madden. We want to welcome everybody, and actually today I want to do a shout out to the folks in New Orleans because they're getting hammered with the coronavirus, and there's so many creative, wonderful folks there I know. So uh, be strong, New Orleans. Um, our poet, Ed Madden, uh, we chose him as our first show because Ed is, is the editor for both my books and, and uh, Tim's. And uh, we really appreciate Ed as not just a, a, a friend and a po fellow poet, but as our editor. He is a full professor uh, at the University of uh, South Carolina. He's from Arkansas, and he is the first poet laureate of Columbia, South Carolina, and we believe he's doing a wonderful job. So with that, we're going to get started with asking questions and listening to Ed Madden. Hey, Ed, I was just, you know, one of my questions I, I wanted to ask you is, when did you start your journey into poetry? Talk a little a bit about your journey and, and how the background sort of shaped your journey. Sure. Well, the first, let me just say thank you to you guys for inviting me to be on. And thank you, Al, for those kind words. Um, my journey. Um, I, I, w I was a, a, a nerdy little farm kid in Arkansas who read too many books. Um, who took books to every family reunion so I didn't have to interact with other people, <laughs> um, who got asked to write a poem for my great-grandfather's birthday uh, at the church building and wrote a stupid poem about how cheese and, I, cheese and wine are great when they're older, like I knew anything about <laughs> either of those things. Um, but I, I wrote a lot when I was a kid. Um, I loved words. I loved language. Um, I don't, I, I can't say when I started, um, but I do remember writing really, really bad poems in high school, um, some of which I still have, to my embarrassment. Um, but I was an English French major at a little liberal arts religious school in Arkansas, went off to graduate school at the University of Texas, uh, did a master's on the American poet, Sharon, master's thesis on the American poet Sharon Olds, um, then wrote a, a doctoral uh, dissertation on early 20th century British and Irish poetry. Um, I didn't do the, the usual MFA uh, or PhD in creative writing route. I, I was a, a literary scholar, but I did take creative writing and translation classes all the way through graduate school as my electives. Um, so I, even, even as I was a, an academic, a professor, I was still always um, writing creatively on the side. Um, so in fact, my, my first poetry book and my first academic book came out at about the same time. Is that enough? Want to know more? No, no that's, that's terrific. And okay. I'm, I'm, I'm really sort of interested in those influences, those poet, poet influences that you had um, in college and in graduate school a little bit more. I know, you know you mentioned Sharon Olds, but who else were you reading and, and, and who else were you trying to copy? You know how we all start trying to imitate who we love. Yeah, um, that's why a lot of my, particularly my undergraduate school poems are so bad. Um, I was reading way too much T.S. Eliot. Um, I wanted to be a mythic, religious, uh, complex poet. Um, and I, 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 I should say I still appreciate all I learned from reading him and writing it about him. Um, I wrote about him in my dissertation, but um, I liked the the, I like the willingness of Sharon Olds to write about seemingly anything. And I know they're not necessarily confessional. She makes it clear that these are, these are, these are, are really, they're poems, they're fictions. They're not confessional poems. They're not confessions, I guess I should say. Um, so I like that, but uh, formally I've always adored um, Wallace Stevens. I've never, <laughs> never written about him other than in the class, but God, I love his work. Um, just, just, just adore um, his work. Um, yeah, I'm not sure what else to say, um, but those were, those were, 
two poets I read a lot through, three poets I read a lot through um, undergraduate school and graduate school. I didn't really start reading contemporary poetry till I was in grad school. Um, I mean, I went to one of those liberal arts schools where 20th century literature ends with William Faulkner and, 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 and T.S. Eliot. So, so I didn't really get much contemporary poetry till after I'd gone off to grad school. You know, I just find the, the way you write um, and your poetry that I love is just so authentic. You know, it's not necessarily, some of it I think um, um, is revealing of, of, uh, of uh, some of the tr things that you really feel strongly about. Uh, but I, you know, the authenticity just rings through. Well, oh, thank you. Your poetry, your work. And, you know, you have this thing about sound. I mean, the soundscape of your poetry is just gorgeous. Yeah, uh, my, my friend Ray McManus uh, makes fun of me because he says I have two voices. One is the Ed voice, but one is Ned, he calls him. And Ned cares more about sound than sense. So uh, when I have, and you'll, you'll see them, every book has, every book has one of these poems, a little tiny quirky poem that's just full, full, full of internal rhyme and assonance and like uh, the poem Ark that starts off the, the book about my dad, um, Ark, the title poem. A barn and a sabarge, a boat, the arch ridge sides like boards, a plastic plank that fits and slitted and fitted slots. Uh, anyway, that poem is just, an, it's a Ned poem. And often those are poems I write when I'm really uh, stuck in a, I was at a, a, a workshop at Hub City years ago up in Spartanburg and someone asked all the panelists um, when they found themselves writing. Um, and I said, I, I like to write early in the morning when I get up, when it's quiet, I'm not censoring myself, I'm just drinking coffee and letting things flow. Um, but some of the best Ned poems I wrote when I was bored in faculty or department meetings and I'm just sitting there listening to words echo in my head, barn, barge, boat, I mean, and so those poems, so I, I said some of my best poems, I think I write when I'm bored, bored stiff in a faculty meeting. Well, you know, the, the, what is- I should read that poem. I should read that poem. Yeah, that'd be great. That'd be great. Ark, Christmas, 1966. The small box is filled with a little beast, a barn that's a barge, a boat, the arc's ridge size like boards, a plastic plank, a deck that drops in fitted slots, but lifted reveals that zoo of twos, heaped beasts to be released beneath a glittering tree, its dove-clipped limbs. Dad's asleep in his reclining seat and crumpled waves of paper recede as mom circles the room. The humming wheel throws light across the walls. That's, those are the tufts of tune right there, man. That's beautiful. It also reveals my age. You know, the, the image there at the end is that color wheel under my grandmother's tree. She always had a color wheel that sort of the, the silver artificial aluminum Christmas tree with a color wheel on it. So that's my rainbow in my Noah story. Well, you know, before you got to the point where you could write poetry like that, and, you know, we all, you know, especially me, go through this, these periods of mediocrity. And, and how did you have patience as a writer and a poet to get through all those mediocre poems you had to write before you could write like that? But, but so first of all, I would say I still write shitty mediocre poems. <laughs> that's, that's, that's what you do. Um, but what you do is you keep writing. Um, and you also keep reading because you learn, you learn about how language works when you read poets that you I don't want to say necessarily influence you, but they can surprise you. Poets that surprise you, poets that, that show you things you can do with language you hadn't thought you could do. Um, and so I think those, the, the, those are two obvious things to say, but I, you know, sometimes you still need to say the obvious. And the obvious is keep writing and keep reading. Um, and maybe not just keep reading um, poets, but fiction, nonfiction, because um, you can learn things about language in all kinds of writing. And who knows, you might read some, I, I do this exercise with, um, I, I, in summers, I work with middle school kids. Um, and I do this exercise with them. Um, I, I print out um, diagrams of patents from a, a, a database of, of, of historical patents. And most of them have no language on them. They're just diagrams of things. And so we talk about machines and we talk about people and what kinds of things can machines do that people can't and what kind of things can people do that machines can't. 
and we make a list of all those on the words on the board and then they have to take one of those diagrams and they write a poem called machine for dreaming or machine for laughing and they write incredible stuff but it's because they're looking at these crazy patent diagrams um so anyway all that to say i just think you can find ideas in all kinds of writing even when it's i suppose not really writing um sorry things things oh, that, that's 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 that, go ahead um uh, go i'm ahead. uh really uh, interested in, you talked about your early influences when you were in college. Who do you read now that just knocks you out? Um, I adore the work of Carl Phillips, um, contemporary poet. I just think he does amazing things with syntax. I know that sounds like such a nerdy thing to say, but I love seeing how he can turn a sentence or a phrase and you fall into the next line and suddenly you realize the sentence is doing something completely different from what you thought it was. And he just takes such risk um, in content and form, but especially form, crazy, crazy things with syntax. Um, also right now I'm reading Ross Gay's um, Catalog of Unabashed Gratitude. I, I think it's a gorgeous book he was supposed to read at USC. Uh, last week, but the coronavirus canceled the whole reading series, and I was so looking forward to hearing him read. And it's just, it's a, it's a gorgeous book, and I think it's a book to be read in the midst of this. I mean, there's a poem about everyone under a fig tree, feeding the joy of feeding each other out of each other's hands, something we couldn't do now. Um, and then the long title poem is just a stunning poem about all the things to be thankful for. Um, I'm also reading um, Nicole Brown, um, what is the name of the book? She's writing lots about animals, and I just think these are stunning poems. She has a book about, I think it's called The Donkey Elegies, um, but her recent work just makes me think about the natural world differently, um, and I think that's important uh, right now. Um, yeah, she not, worked at an animal shelter, I think, for a while. Yeah. Now. Yeah. Wrote that collection. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just beautiful, beautiful poems. Mm -hmm. well, well, you recently went um, to, uh, to Brazil on a sabbatical. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, sure. So um, I was on sabbatical last fall and I, I um, had received a, a, a residency at the Sakatar Foundation. Sakatar is an artist institute on the island of Itaparica, uh, which is off the coast of uh, Bahia, Brazil. Um, it's a two month residency uh, with five other artists, all, all disciplines. Uh, when I was there, I was with um, two visual artists who are painters, um, a playwright, a textile artist, and, and a Brazilian priestess, um, and an arts curator. Um, they were from Greece, Spain, Brazil, and, um, and from Los Angeles. So uh, very international, very interdisciplinary. Um, and I was there two months from mid-November to, to mid-January. Um, and it was, uh, I mean, I, I don't, I, I, it's not a word I use, life-changing, but it was a life-changing experience, um, both in how I thought about my writing process and how I thought about the world around me, how I thought about time. I mean, that's the thing I really wanted to write about. My project for going down there was to write and think about time and memory, um, time and memory and family, but especially time. Talk a little bit more about that, the, the markers of time and the things you thought about in terms of time while you were there. Um, so, I mean, part of it was just being in this new space where, where thing, time is marked differently. Um, uh, the tides, like I've never lived near the ocean and didn't know that tides move 40 minutes every day. Um, so the tides, the sun, um, the birds. Um, every morning there was a hummingbird below my studio. Every afternoon a bunch of parrots uh, came to a bush out front. And, and then every evening right at sunset, this little owl would fly by um, on its way up the little river uh, that was near my studio. 
Um, and just to, there was another, one of the artists there, Laura Gorski from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Um, she is a painter, um, an extraordinary visual artist, and she was also working with times. She was specifically trying to make uh, or making visual diagrams of the tides. Um, but we talked a lot about time. We both are sort of compulsive uh, beachcombers, so we would pick up stuff on the beach. Um, and uh, anyway, so we, we talked a lot about how time works, how we measure time, um, how we mark time uh, when we're living. We talked about the difference between the clocks on the wall and the clocks embedded in our bodies. Like I, I never used an alarm there. I woke up every morning with the sun. Um, so lots of different things. And I wrote lots of little, little tiny poems um, about time. I'm, I, and I'm still putting them together. I'm not sure what the sequence is going to be, um, but lots of little quirky poems about time. I can read have, a couple. Have, have, yeah, yeah, that would be wonderful. Um, I, 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 and I call the sequence tempo because I really like that in Portuguese, tempo means like a music tempo, like we use it, but it also means the weather. You would say, how's the tempo today? Uh, the weather. Um, and it means time. So it's all three of those things at once. Um, so I'll just read a few of these. I've written a whole bunch in it. And again, I'm not sure the order they go in, um, but these are some of the ones I wrote. Tempo. <laughs> ahead. Ahead the day that burns my face, behind the day that darkens my back. Which one is the future and which the past? One day is sun, the next is rain, mostly though the days are bright. What, what blue is the bay? Which blue the sky? Morning is a mixed chorus of song. Afternoon is parrots outside the window. I'm still learning the time clock of birds. The angel of time wears wings of money. The angel of time carries a clock. Always he flies from left to right. The child is followed by the man. A man is followed by a child. A car stops for a horse in the middle of the road. Here I have stopped wearing a watch. Things start on time or they don't. It doesn't matter all that much. And actually I love that about by Ian's sense of time, if something doesn't, you know, if something's supposed to start at 12, it might start at 1230. We'll see. Um, I remember, I mean, I thought about time too, because I was there during the holidays. I had Thanksgiving, Christmas, and New Year's there, big, you know, uh, temporal markers in, in the American calendar. And uh, I remember New Year's Day, we were having lunch, and I, I, I leaned over to Laura, who was organizing our New Year's Eve dinner, New Year's Eve dinner. And I said, uh, what time will dinner be tonight? You know, being an American, I, I need to be there at the right time. And she just looked at me and she said, it will happen. And I thought, oh, I love this. I love this. It will happen. Um, so I, I love that sense of time. But I was also very conscious of time. And I, I know you and I talked about this uh, earlier. Um, I had a countdown clock on my phone for when Bert was going to come. So my husband was coming at the very last week. He was going to be there for our big um, open studio day, and then we stayed for another couple of weeks to travel. Um, so that for me was another marker of time. Every day I would open my phone, and how many days was it till Bert was there? Uh, so another way of marking time. And I, we were talking about the, the quote uh, that I ran across um, by Jorge, uh, the Argentinian um, writer, poet, uh, Borget, uh, um, how do you say his name, man? Um, Borges? Yeah, Borges. Yeah. Borges. Uh, he's the one that wrote, being with you and not being with you is the only way I have to measure time. And I just think that's just a lovely uh, expression. It's lovely, but it's also so weirdly timely right now where we're all locked in at home with, I hope, the people we love. Um, so so it, it is the measure of time now. I have a a poem I could read that, that, that may work with that. Um, um, it's, a, it's a love poem I wrote for Bert. And it's kind of about time because it was written before marriage became legal. Um, so it's called My Husband Who Is Not My Husband. Um, so is it okay if I read that? Oh, please. Oh, that would be wonderful. My Husband Who Is Not My Husband. Um, and this was published in a tiny little chat book Seven Kitchens Press did called So They Can Sing. Um, it's a, and if you don't know that press, they're a lovely press uh, run by a poet named Ron Mooring, 
Um, to do, all they do are these little hand stitched, uh, tiny, beautiful chapbooks. Um, anyway, my husband was not my husband. His priestly gestures, consecrating the broken eggs, hands moving over the stove, slabs of meat skittering in grease, drop biscuits big as a cat's head, threaded with cheese. Him making the fountain, making lantana, acanthus, making bloom and ripple song, making the birds. My husband, the blue room, the bright room, best china, best silver lifted from a box in the closet, its red beds of best silver put back later for later. My husband, who is not my husband, who is still mine, See him crying in the Dublin airport. He doesn't want you to see. Can you see the eucomas, its waxy leaves, its stalk blossoming in the hot sun, pushing up among the marigolds? Scars from this or that on shin or back, wrist or hand, the way the garden loves him, the bees, him among the lilies, his hands lilies, his mouth a twist of quince, his scent, my husband among the lilies. My husband sauntering down the aisles, him sauntering down the aisles at the flea market, dust settling on everything, his small flashlight, his blue eyes, his sound of geese, the train. Look, something glitters and is gone. My husband, the gold in the trees falling, and him, a coverlet of mulch across the beds or asleep, the heat of him, the hot water bottle of him, the cat purring at our feet. My husband, who is not my husband, who is still mine, the blue walls say so the orchid deciding to bloom again. That was wonderful. Thank you. The, I, I like the, the phrase where you go, the quince, the sense. I uh -huh. mean, that, that almost rhyme that's there really, yeah. really sounds, you know, for Thank me, you. It, it like tickles the ear. Good, thanks. I, yeah. I, like, I like poems that are sonically dense. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I didn't say this earlier, but a poet I also I adore is Gerard Manley Hopkins. Uh, so thinking of sonically dense poets, he, he, he would be one um, I would look to as well. Do you remember when you were first introduced to Hopkins? Was it that first uh, undergraduate school experience? Or? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was at a, a religious school. So the poems had a theological import as well as uh, the, the, the um, I don't remember a lot about the class, but I do remember that's where I was introduced to him. Do you find you want poems that you think ha have a real sonic intensity to them? Do you read them out loud as well? They're more fun if you read out loud. I, yes. mean, I, love, I love a poem you feel in your mouth as you're reading it. Like it's, you feel it. Um, mm -hmm. I like poems that do that. Um, yeah. Yeah, short answer, yes. I love to read poems that are sonically dense out loud. Okay. That, that's why I like the Psalms. They have such a, a feel when you read them. King James Version, of course. Yeah. They, they just, you just feel it. Yeah, one of my, I went to a seminary between my master's and my doctorate, and I think one of my, maybe my favorite class there was a class on, on the, the wisdom literature of the Old Testament. Um, so we spend a lot of time on the Psalms and the Proverbs. Um, so I, so I, I, yeah, I get what you're saying um, and the kind of parallelisms and rhythms in that. I don't think I write that way, but I, but I do love that as well. You know, it's, it's funny sometimes you don't realize what you absorb and what you read enters and enters your poetry somehow. And, and yeah. it seems to me in a way, um, Hopkins enters arc, um, you know, because he has that great line all of water and arc. Yeah, 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 yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm thinking too, not just Hopkins, but the way you talk about that, I'm often surprised when hymn lyrics or biblical language suddenly comes up in a poem, and I realize it's because I've so interiorized that language from growing up um, in a fundamentalist religious culture. Um, so those things... Those things are very much part of the language of my head, the language of how I write. Uh, so in, I think in particular, my, my book, um, Nest, which has lots of retold Bible stories, but there are lots of poems in there that, that, that hymn language, um, Bible language, uh, sort of weaves and infiltrates um, through the poems. So to switch just a little bit, but it's a very important part of your life right now. You, you are the first Poet Laureate of Columbia. You're on your second, I guess we call term. 
Yeah. And uh, I'd like to say that you, as, as poet lawyer, you've done a very good job of connecting the town and gown, the university community, as well as the city. Because some <laughs> folks don't do that very well. Thank Either you. they're all gown or they're all town. But I, I really appreciate how you've, you've, you've gathered us all together. When you write as, as, as a poet laureate, how is that different from the Ed Madden poet voice that's, that's not writing for the public, but more internal? Um, I think the fundamental difference, uh, I mean, the language is often going to be the same. The obsessive thinking is often going to be the same. And the process is often going to be the same. Um, but... I'm much more conscious of accessibility um, because I know often like the poems I write for the state of the city, the mayor's annual state of the city address, it's going to be read in front of a few hundred people, some of whom may never be exposed to another poem the rest of that year. Um, so for me, it's important. It's important that I do the thing I set out to do in the poem. Um, but it's also important to me that it have, a level of accessibility that I, I think I would not have thought about earlier before I took this position. So I, ho I hope that the, they work that way. I hope they I hope have. They do. You know, and I think that makes perfect. Um, it's, a, it's a really, I think, good thing to be intentional about. Um, that you want your reader to be able to enter your poem um, in, in, in really um, in, in profound ways. And, and I think if you, if you write in such a way that there's a barrier to that, it's, it, um, it sets up a, a difficult fence for the reader. Yeah. And I, I think some poems are more successful than others. Um, obviously, if you look back at what I've written over the last five years or so, um, but, but I do, I am very conscious of that. And I think part of that too comes, my very first year, um, as the, the city laureate, you know, I wrote a poem for the first day of the city. I was charged with writing a poem for the, the anniversary of the burning of Columbia during the commemoration of the Civil War. Um, but when the shooting happened in Charleston, one of the council members, I mean, one of the council members just texted me. Um, he was already taking me to lunch um, at his Rotary Club or Kiwanis, whatever it was. And he said, you are the poet laureate. You should say something about this. And there was a kind of um, moment, um, there was a kind of responsibility <laughs> in being told that you're someone who should say something about this. Um, and I think that sort of triggered for me that very first year, um, a sense of responsibility toward writing differently, um, toward writing in a way that would reach a broader audience than I would have thought about earlier. Both, uh, you know, I love your poem for the, uh, this year that you wrote for the inaugural inauguration um, this year. Well, not not the inauguration. It was this the state, state of the city. Yeah, state of the city. Yeah, uh, and, and, and ironically, it's it's a poem totally influenced by my time in Brazil. I mean, I I, I got back and a week later, a uh, week and a half later, I had to to have a poem ready, um, and it's it's about time. Um, so it's, it's completely influenced um, by that by that experience. But it also, I was thinking about time because this was the mayor's tenth and a tenth state of the city address. He had been in the position for a decade, so he I knew his speech. Occasionally, they give me a few thoughts that are influencing what the mayor is doing, and I knew his speech was going to be about time and about the changes of the city uh, over the course of the last decade. But you know, also your your poem, uh, the shorter poem about the new flag, I think is lovely. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank just, you. I thought it was just sonically beautiful. Just, you know, really just um, flapping well, the red wind beautiful, you know. Thank you. I'm going to say, Al, you're, you inspired it because you had posted something about um, you posted something about it, and all these people were jumping on, saying they didn't like it, and uh, what did it? And particularly, two people said, "What does it mean? What does it look like?" And I thought, "Oh, okay, so that's where I'm going to start with. What does it mean? What does it look like?" Um, so, so you're responsible for the poem, Al, or at oh. least all the people who jump on your comments on Facebook. Yeah. Well, thank you. 
Uh, I guess I've inspired something in my life. <laughs> what else can you read for us, Ed? Um, would you read for us? If it, I, I would love to read a, a poem from my last book. Um, and it's called Art, the, the book is. I read the poem earlier. Um, and it's about um, in 2011, I moved home uh, to stay with my parents and help take care of my father uh, when he was dying of, of cancer. Um, and so is so I'd like to read something for that book. It's That'd one be, of, it's one of be my beautiful. Favorite poems. It's one of my favorite poems. Um, and it has, it, honestly, thinking back to my, my, my youth, it has a biblical image right there in the middle of the poem, which is the image of a son kneeling before his father to receive his blessing. Anyway, it's called How, how to Lift Him. And obviously I'm thinking literally of the nurse teaching me how to pick up my father's body um, how to, to do that thing that I didn't know how to do, but also how to lift him. So how to lift him. What is that noise? I'm sorry. Do you guys hear that? I, I hear sometimes a, a fan, but it's not in my room because I don't have a... Okay. Have Maybe it's just me. Maybe it's just me. Is it a, is it a, a little bird? No, it's a buzz. Yeah, I hear a buzz. Don't know. Anyway, I'll read. How to lift him. Don't pick him up by the armpits, which seems easiest. You risk broken bones, bruised skin. Instead, once he's eased up, sits, shoulders hunched, feet slung over the edge, lean down for the hug, your arms under his and around, hands flat against his back, with arms around you. This is what you do. Then lift him, his feet between yours, this timid dance around, this turn. Tell him to bend his knees as you ease him down to the chair, its wheels locked. Set him in slow. Kneel in front as if to receive his blessing. Lift each foot to its rest. Wrap a blanket around him. You're going out. Stop at the old flat desk, last hiding place for his cigarettes, why he wanted up after all. Stop at the edge of the porch and lock the wheels. Make sure he's in the sun. Stand silent by, he won't talk much, though the lonely cat will, rubbing its back against the wheels. When you read, when you read some of your poems, especially those very personal poems, do you actually as you're reading, go back in time to that, that moment? Um, it, depends on, it depends on which poem and where I'm reading and all those sorts of things. Although I can't help but that, with that one physically remember that being taught how to put my arms under his and, and my hands flat against his back. I mean, it's not just a, a mental memory, a cognitive memory. It's a physical memory of learning how to do that. Hmm. And the more ways you connect to, to words, the more powerful they are. Well, thank you. There's a, another um, this book I was reading last night that had a quote that I think fits a little bit of that poem or that the, the thought of with us all about life and death. Um, it, and it goes, if you divide death by life, you will find a circle. Hmm. And I, I think it's uh, uh, these circles of, of life and death that are all around us. Uh, I think of those all the time. And I think of, of you know, the, the fact of being a caretaker, um, which you were um, for your father, and how um, those moments um, enter you in, in profound ways. Um, and, and even though your father may not have been able to express <laughs> how much he, he, you know, loved you being there, um, how important it was for him that you were there. And how important for me that I was there as well. Yeah. Al, you have anything else? No. I'm, I'm wondering if uh, Ed would, would end with one other poem. Do you have another poem so we can end? Sure. Um, how about I read a, uh, 
I'll read a crazy religious poem. How about that? And it's one I wrote for my friend Ray McManus, which, which by the way, Ray is essential. Um, and I say this because I think one of the things um, you have to have as a poet is someone who will read your poems and tell you what works and what doesn't. Um, and he's someone I can trust to kind of get my voice, but also say, mm, cut those four lines. This is crap. Um, so I think it's important as a writer to have someone who will, who, who understands your voice, but will also be honest. Um, so this is a poem for him. Um, it's called an old pew, like an old church pew. Hooray. He wanted the God of the flannel graph, God of the box of crayons, God of grape Kool-Aid and stale cookies, God of the paper tabernacle, God of the quiz bowl, God of the gold star, God of Aunt Maxine and Uncle Doug. He got God of the tent meeting, the gospel revival, God of the cold immersion, God of the burning cross, God of must the young die too, God of brother Wyatt, God of the funeral flowers, God of the last verse sung once again for the lost, for the sinners, for the unsaved that remain out there. Yes, you know who you are. He wanted a song of the pitch pipe, song of the rich old king, song of the red and yellow, black and white, song of clap your hands, song of stomp your feet, song of the happy shout, the song sung in rounds. He heard the altar call song, the invitation song, the revival song, song about a fount of blood, song of the roll call and the last trumpet, song of being blind, song of sinking deep, song of the deep stain, song of the worm. Let there be a song for the man who doesn't sing. Let there be a song for the man who walks away, song of the dark hand, song of the wandering feet, song of the unsung. Let there be a God of the night bloom, God of the guest room, God of the quince and winter wheat, God of last call and first guess, God of the frozen drink, God of the hairy chest, God of the road trip, God of the homegrown, God of the homeward and homely, God of the shared home, a repurposed God, God of the unsaid, God of the old church pew at the foot of the bed. Ed, what year did you write that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> um, it's from my third book, but I think I wrote it much earlier. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Why, why do you ask? Yeah, I was just wondering. It's beautiful. Uh, you know, and I guess I, it was it. I guess both y'all were out of school, or yeah. I was out of school when you wrote that, and. and you know, I was just. I wrote it after I moved to South Carolina. I wrote it here, and after. I mean, within the past six, ten years, um, but it's very much a, a poem about figuring out what you keep of your past, yeah. what, what you find valuable and meaningful now, and what you need to rework um, to live the way you want to live now. What a way to end the show, because that's exactly, I think, what we're all doing, um, yeah. or more at this time. You know, it's such a crazy time, and, and, you know, it's so important that we figure what's important now, now, more than ever. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you guys for inviting me on your first show. And just to say quickly, what a joy, a pleasure it was uh, to work with you both on your books. Yes. Well, thank you for that. And, and I, I do want to say, not just to you, but to everyone that, that listens to this show in, in the future, this time that we're in, while it's forced upon us, we can either look at the bad that's involved about the restrictions, or we can look at the gifts uh, that we're going to get from this. Uh, and I'm trying, and I hope everybody tries to focus on the positive of this. We wouldn't have done this show with Ed if there hadn't been this time where we have to, to communicate virtually yeah. and i and i I'm, I'm i'm excited about in many ways about what's going to come out of this time and it, it's so special to have you as the first show well thank you thank you very much this has been this has been fun thank you ed we love you man love you guys